All right, welcome to the show. Um, if you guys could hit that like and subscribe button for me before we get started, that would be awesome. Today I have a really cool and special guest. His name is Larry Justanis. He has a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience in training athletes, specifically football players. He runs a, spe a sports specific training facility up in Canada and I'll let him kind of take over and introduce himself, tell you about his journey um, all the experiences he has had to get where he's at. So, Larry, welcome, and thanks for taking the time. Hey, thanks, Will. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I've had a journey a lot older than you and things like that. So, um, like you said, I've run Sports Pacific Trans Company's name for the last 25 years. I started that after I uh, played in the CFL and things like that. And as I told you, the premise of Sports Pacific Training started when I was at Central Florida and lost my scholarship because I got hurt lifting weights and things like that. I couldn't throw a football for a year. So, uh, the promise came to my mind that I need to be able to help young athletes, you know, so they don't go through this, what I went through, right? So we started that, uh, you know, successfully and had some great athletes come through there. Uh, and then four years ago, we started, a pro, uh, you know, another program called Football North, uh, where one, you know, two-year players in North Dakota are at right now. Football North would be like very similar to the uh, poor man's IMG, I call it, of Canada. You know, we get football players from all over the country. Um, they train, they They've studied all, it's basically a mini university program. We're trying to teach them that. And they only play games in the U.S. Last year, they played seven of the top 11 teams, seven teams in the top 100 in the U.S. Uh, so we started four years ago. Fortunate to get good athletes that really want to be there and the good student athletes. And I think we've got 28 Division One players in the last four years, which, you know, is a testament to the athlete, the student athlete doing the work, right? So that's basically where I'm at. You know, uh, I love – Sprint training, I love strength training, I love QB training. So that'd be my my forte, if you say, you know, if you ask me what I'd love to do, and, um, and that's that's basically me in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So so the team that you work with, uh, the football team you work with. So you're in Canada, but you're playing American ball. Correct. Is that common? Are there other um, American so ball teams up in Canada that do the same thing you guys no, do? No, there's a few other prep schools, we call them prep schools that may do that, right? Um, but very, very few do it, maybe two or three. That's about it. Um, okay. And like I said, you know, we win, you know, we were, I think we won five games last year. We win games, which is, you know, kind of an important thing to do as well. Like we beat a top 30 team last year. Um, but it's not common. No, it's not at all, right? It's especially, you know, they go to school in a regular high school but they're specialized in their football programs. So, you know, after school, they have study hall, academic advisors, and they, they're in a football meetings, they're in a whatever, right? During the season and then after the season, they're in the strength training, speed training, skill training, just like they would do at college. We just do it all after school, right? And, you know, we have spring training, spring practices, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, do most of the kids come from uh, locations pretty far away or most of them local to the Toronto uh, I'd area? Say, I'd say 70% are local to the Toronto area. We're kind of in a big map, you know, GTA, Toronto's a big city, right? So yeah. they're called GTA, Greater Toronto Area. So most of our athletes come from there. Just like you would do recruiting college, most colleges will stay within six to eight hours, you know, within their state to get their players. And then you may go out to some other states to get some other players, right? So that's mm -hmm. how our philosophy is with regard to that as well, too. Yeah. So most of the kids are coming there with uh, the goal to um, get a division one scholarship yeah, in, yeah. in the NCAA. So um, how involved are you with the recruiting process and kind of mentoring kids when it comes to that? Very much so, you know, we're just, uh, you're always calling coaches and helping players out and sending out film and uh, trying to educate the parents. Like yesterday we did a zoom uh, seminar, three NCAA coaches on, you know, what it, does it take to be a Division One athlete? What do they need to do for recruiting? So we you know we spent an hour with three Division One coaches on the you know taping that stuff like that for, to educate the parents as much as the kids as well too. So we do a lot of work, you know. Like I was telling you, I was talking to your coach yesterday regarding some of our players already. So that's what you not and not everybody's D one athlete. Let's be honest, right? And I'm not trying to say that, but we're typically looking for those type of players, uh, and maybe they're not Division One, maybe they're FCS, maybe they're you know, division two, whatever, it doesn't matter. But ultimately what you want at the end of it is to become better people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want. And that the in 10 years from now, they come back to the school and say, Hey, that's a great program. Thanks. Best coach you ever had. That's what you're looking to do. Right. And mm -hmm. football is just part of that journey and part of that process. Yeah. So one thing that I saw on your Instagram that I really liked was your dog tip mode of the I tip of the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so then <laughs> get a lot of traction. <laughs> so um, and you just touched on like what it takes to become a division one athlete. Um, 
just could you kind of give us your rationale or what you think it t- what what does it take to become a division one athlete yeah. when you're talking to parents or talking to these high school yeah. kids that are coming through yeah and that, you know like if you're five foot two 300 pounds like let's be you know let's be realistic about that i don't think it's going to happen right and i'm not trying to be a jerk but reality sometimes has to sit in but i think you know that's a big it's a big question in the sense of you know what it takes and i you know talking to coaches yesterday and the my biggest thing is toughness and i'm not just talking about physical toughness mental toughness because when you go to division one football program division one whatever hockey whatever you're playing you know you gotta be mentally tough because one you're getting up early you know either you got practice or study hall or something your your hours are you know basically charted out in front of you right in that sense and you're competing at a high level you may be the big fish right now in your small pond you may come as a quarterback and there's five others of you like that right so that's where i think the mental part of it i think you'll be mentally tough uh go through a lot of things and that's that's a hard thing right i don't think you can just judge it and just say hey this kid's mentally tough right now without going through some some trials and tribulations of games and all that kind of stuff so that'd be my biggest thing that i'm looking for because you know, if he fits the mold of the Division One athlete, because everything's a copycat, a kind of copycat league, does he have the mental toughness? Maybe, the, you know, that's the difference, I think, between being elite and being average, right, is that. So that's what we're trying to look at, and you try to you try to do that, right? And I think Urban Meyer, when I watched Urban Meyer, you know, he took over Ohio State, he says, you know what, we're going to win nine games at Ohio State just because we're Ohio State football, right? You know, we get lucky and we don't have many injuries, we'll win the conference championship. But if we get really lucky, we're going to win the national championship. And he goes, when I came in, four guys from the, you know, they had a lot of talent still Ohio State. They're Ohio State. Four guys, you know, we're conditioning them and things like that. And uh, he says, four kids try to say, you can't break us. And Urban's like, we can break you if we want to break you. That's not the point, right? We're trying to make a team. So I think that's what you have to look at as a team. I think that's an important thing. And I think mental toughness comes from the weight room, mm-hmm. the off season. I think there's, you know, there's the game season, which is fun for football players, you know, but the off season is that grind. I think that's where you get mental toughness. And that's where I think is a, if I was a, if I was an NCAA division one coach, I would follow the model of I would hire a strength coach first because you spend the most time with them, mm-hmm. you know, over a positional coach. So I'd want that guy. I think Urban figured that out very quickly. That's why he's had success. Right. And I think that's an important skill because that coach is going to work with that person for a long time. So do you do anything specifically trying to kind of train that mental toughness side with your, uh, with your guys on your team? Yeah, we have function. We call I call it functional Friday days. So probably one of my biggest regrets, to be honest, is a long time ago, I started training like tire flipping, all that kind of stuff, you know, what I call functional kind of movements. Uh, and I made videos and they sold out. And I thought, ah, you know what? Internet's not going to be a big thing. This is, I sold like 500 videos. I thought that's great. You know, 500 DVDs, but it's probably my biggest regret is not, promoting that more at that mm-hmm. time right so i think you do competition you know we have tried to have com- competitive competitive days once a week uh in the sense of you know tire flip whatever those kind of functional type of movements are it's just kind of get that going so they get a little more mentally tough uh last year i tried to have guys jog out you know if they lost if they lost their event they had to go run in the, on the snow and ice barefoot and, mm-hmm. the, and the reason i did that wasn't because I didn't want, I just want to see who would be mentally tough. If we get a bad game, who can I, who can I rely on bad mm-hmm. weather game? Right. Until that got nixed by the principal who said it's an insurance problem. So everything becomes a liability. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so we stopped on that one. Yeah. That's one that's, you know, you just, you try to do, com- I think competitive games and kind of make it, get them out of the realm, not just the weight room realm, you know, and make it tough on them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. So then See, I don't know how this process really works. Um, I just went to a normal high school um, yeah. in in Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Played on the local or on the high school football team. Yeah. Um, and there's there's no cuts on a high school football team. You sign yeah. up and you're on the team no matter what. So sure. if you being at this uh this prep school or this uh, club team, do you guys regularly make cuts from year no. to year? No. no, it's it's a prep. So it's a high school. Remember, it's just a regular high school. Kids mm-hmm. are high school. So it's not a club team, but it is a high school. It's just they don't play in Canada. They just play their schedule in the U.S. Oh, so we okay. don't cut because we don't bring a lot of kids. We just bring in a certain number of kids, you know, that we think can fit the mold of us every year. Some kids get cut because of reasons of, you know, they got to follow the mold of, you know, any type of program, you know, right? You got to fit our culture. If it doesn't, then, you know, it's time to go, mm-hmm. right, in that sense. But, and, you know, they're students first. So if they get in trouble, 
they're going to fight. They're going to suspend it just like you right. would have at your Minneapolis high school. Right. So mm-hmm. just think that I always tell everybody to school first. It's all about football. I mean, it's academics. And then all you're doing is you're just training for football and playing an American schedule. That's the only difference. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then you play your season. Um, and then what does your off season typically look like? Do you guys, um, typically have go through an off season strength and conditioning program, I'm assuming. And is it, is it an annual plan or do do you have some athletes that are also participating in other sports? No, so we don't. They have an annual plan. So they'll start, we'll give them two weeks off, uh, off of football in the weight room after the season ends. They'll still do go to school, do all that kind of stuff. And then we start a preparatory phase. Our semester is a little different here because we go till uh, September to February and then February to June. So a lot of prep phase, you know, in that December area and then January, February, March, April, May, we start, you know, we train them after school. So, you know, it all depends. You know, we're doing speed training two, three times a week. We're doing, you know, we're lifting weights every day, basically after school or lunch. Uh, with, and if a guy needs extra work, like if we think a kid needs to lose more weight or do something, we'll tell them they need to do something at lunch as well too. Uh, so that's how our program works. And then we get out on the field, right? And we do, you know, last year I think we had close to 20 padded practices. And I think we would have had probably the same this year and a big scrimmage. But unfortunately with everything that's going on, we're unable to do that at that time, right? At this time. So you have a, a like a real full spring practice schedule, yeah. just like colleges. Yeah, like we're, we're outside twice in March already. Wow. You know, we would have been out, I'd say right now, we'd have been out 10 to 15 times already. You know, we yeah. don't have, we don't have any limitations how many practices we do. We're just smart about it. You know, we're not going to hit and go pad it every day or whatever, right? So we're out twice, you know, twice in the field in March, but we're doing stuff in the gym or, doing some skill training in the indoor domes as well too. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so when you're going through your spring practices, so in college you have 15 designated days. Yeah. Um, and I know at UND they go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And yeah. so three days a week for, I don't know, five, six, however many, however long it takes yeah. them to get their 15. Do you guys kind of do the same thing where you spread it out over time like that? We go by the weather to be honest. Right. Okay. So if I say Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week, and I look outside and it's going to be really cold and snowy on, Monday, well, guess what? Practice goes on Tuesday, right? Yeah. So yeah. we lift, you know, we do something, right? So we'll lift weights first of some sort, and then we'll go and practice, right? So if that's, you know, we'll just change it. We'll do more speed training or something on those other days, right? But that's yeah. how we typically do it. So yes, April, May, we'd be outside probably three times a week. Okay. You know, some sort of, of football training. Yeah. And then is most of the spring practice designated for like individual position work or is it learning playbook, learning the schemes, getting both, some 11 yeah. on 11 work? In yep. both? Uh, we do, we do everything, right? Just like a college, right? We do mm-hmm. lots of, there's a time we do, we call it fundamental or indie period time. We do a yep. lot of that. And then, uh, you know, we're zooming everybody right now. We have meetings three times a week, offense and defense and special teams. So they're getting their implementation of, you know, all their plays and their formations and all that stuff. So we at least get the mental part done and they're getting tests every day. So they're tested all the time, right? Obviously, we can't do the physical part, but, you know, mental, as you know, as a former player, that's three quarters of the battle, right? You know, yeah. you're it's mental. So we're really staying on top of them for that. Uh, but that's how we would do it, you know, on the field as well, too. Yeah. Well, geez, I can see why why Kyle came so prepared. He's He's been through yeah. it before he came yeah. to college. So, that's right. yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. So now getting more into, like, the strength and conditioning side of this. Yeah you're their primary strength and conditioning coach. What does a typical training session look like? Um, I mean, I know I work with college athletes, yep. so I'm working with kids a little bit older. I'm yep. not so sure that really changes the exercise selection. I mean, just what's your yeah. general, general. Uh, so we, we, we split them up, um, do the fact that we have weight room, but it's just not big enough for 50 kids. So we split them up. You know, I've got my assistant coaches are really good strength coaches too. They, you know, I, you know, for example, my defense coordinator, his son is at Syracuse. I trained him. You know what I mean? So Nick and Nick and I trained together at university. So he has some of like Jamie, my OC. I trained him through university. So they know my philosophies of strength training. So we can split them up, right? Where I'll take, I'll start off with speed work, you know, a big, you know, working on speed with half the group and they'll sit in the, in the weight room at GPP type of levels, right? So can, do they squat? Do they deadlift? Yeah, they do all that stuff, right? Uh, you know, bigger groups are harder to teach, I think, cleans and, you know, more li- – because I think Olympic lifting is a skill and a sport in itself, right? So, For sure. So um, it takes time, obviously, right, guys? Some guys get it, some guys don't. 
Uh, but I think we prep them and we build just like, you know, we periodize everything. We undulate a lot of things uh, and they train pretty hard, right? Uh, something I invented last year was more time sets. I did two years ago. Instead of a kid counting eight reps, you know, GPP phase, we may, we may do, we may do, rep, we may do reps for 45 seconds. So that way we can roll, you know, four, four or five squat racks in a row. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we adjust their weights and things like that. So we're, you know, like for example, Kyle would have done, you know, sometimes four or five on the squat for 45 seconds when he was here. Right. Which is grueling. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of part of that mental toughness and GPP and adaptation phase we would do. Right. But then we get into more maximal force stuff. We'd obviously use lower reps and things like that. But you know, the, the thing about, I don't know about you guys, but kids all it's normal athletes, you know, they do a set and they want to go again. They don't understand like to produce right. maximal force or velocity, you know, you're not really sweating. You know, mm -hmm. so I think that's a key component of coaching, which I think's, you know, anybody can make a guy sweat. That's, that's easy, right? I can get on a bike and make you sweat, whatever. But key to coaching, I think, is can you train them with uh, just not over train them, but almost under train them to get the same effect and to use the right rest parameters to get what you need, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an art and a skill in coaching, right? As a mm -hmm. strength coach, it's hard to do in big groups. You know, you as a yeah. strength coach do a big group. It's easy one on one. I control that factor. When I got 50 guys and they're all from different areas and they, you know, different modalities, some guys have lifted weights, some guys have never lifted weights. And to me, until I get them, they really haven't lifted weights with, you know, what I want. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I use Kyle, for example, Kyle comes back and he understands what I want to do. Right. With them, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, you know, I think in, you may have, you know, you may get some guys that are strong, but relatively speaking, I think athletes are very weak right now. You know, I think video games and just not playing outside makes them weak. So yeah. I think that that base we talk about, the athlete base, you know, and I think that takes time, right? Uh, yeah. I don't know if they know how to work yet, you know, in that yeah. sense, right? Yeah, I think just getting athletes stronger, it's such it's low-hanging fruit. Yes. If you can just get them stronger, everything else is going to come. And yep. then I think even working at the Division One level, most kids can continue to get stronger freshman, sophomore, junior, all the way through their senior year. Sure. And then if, if you're at the point where getting stronger is taking so much energy that is taken away from you getting better at your sport, then yeah, you can start to use more advanced methods yeah. and more velocity based work. But yeah, put, putting on strength is going to help so many people just improve yeah. every other athletic quality yeah. um, for sure. sure. And so you also work with athletes of other sports too, do you kind of have the, the same general philosophy working with other athletes? Like are athletes uh, just athletes to you and you athletes are athletes to me. Yeah. I, I do agree. I, I do think there's a, I call them predictor lifts for every sport that I've, you know, kind of have that I've used and, you know, maybe I've changed a little bit, but I think there's predictor lifts, but I think, you know, if we can teach him to get stronger and faster in any sport, like I, I know for a long time with my hockey guys, when I start, cause I started hockey guys, if I can get them faster from zero to 10 on the ground, I know on ice it correlated over because I tested them, you know, re relevant of their mechanics because that's a whole different, you know, realm of talking, you know, and things like that. But I knew I figured that out real quickly. Right. And I thought, okay, well that makes sense. Right. And uh, just, you know, you get a basketball guy or whatever, usually basketball guys, you know, they don't love the gym. They're tall. Right. They're not mechanically they're disadvantaged mechanically, right. To lift weights. So a trickier sport to work with, right. Definitely, you know, basketball players. So, but I know if you get them, you know, they're the type of, I have a, I have a saying, you know, you know, either you're either too slow for your strength or too weak for your speed. And that's, you know, I use that for my testing parameters. And I, you know, example, Kyle Hergel would have been too slow for his strength, right? So he needs to do more speed type of work for his strength. Where I think basketball players are, you know, too weak for their speed. So, you know, you need to do different things for them as well too. So I think we're strength training there helps them out dramatically. You know, they'll jump higher just by doing that, right? Yeah. But it's hard to get a basketball guy off the court. Oh, yeah. You know, and I learned that from my mentor when I did a track and field. I had 100 meters. I had the long distance, uh, uh, long jump champion of Canada training me. And I told him he's not going to run or jump for six weeks. Tell that to an athlete like that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we did strength training for four weeks. He didn't, he didn't even tell me he goes, in a, he goes into a meet. And runs his personal best at 60 meters, yeah. right? And it just showed, and this is, and it just and it proved to him that 
you didn't have to run to get faster. Right. And I think that's important. Right. So, yeah. but you got to take that time off too, to get that base. Right. Mm -hmm. So spending time at UCF, you know exactly what it's like um, as far as the, the training goes with most college programs um, over the, like the course of your career, how much has really changed in your opinion from when you were playing at UCF to your time in the CFL to now? That's a great question. We used to do three day training practices in August. Uh, it was called hell week. So right mm -hmm. off the bat, there's no three days in, in NCAA mm -hmm. to the point where it's so hot, your cleats would melt in the track, walking on the track in the middle of Florida. Right. So I think it's much more science-based now, which is great. I think there's more, great strength coaches out there. I think strength coaches were just, you know, I don't know what the right term back then was just something to have. Right. But now everybody has to have one. Right. I think that's an important thing. So I think science based, I think that's the biggest thing. I think using rest, you know, like I think it was more your big lifts back then and conditioning, you know, and I think anybody, but speed training is an art. Right. You know, I think I learned that from Charlie Francis when he worked with Ben Johnson, who closed his eyes and he could tell if Ben, was running slower and the session was over because you need to teach a guy to run a maximal speed. So if he repeats it over and over and he's running sub maximal, you're just teaching him to run at sub maximal speed and you're just fatiguing the athlete. So what's the use then, right? We're not getting him faster. So that would be one thing. You know, I think that's the biggest thing I think I've seen over the longevity of that, right? And I think people and nutrition, I think, you know, people go, hey, you got this guy fast in the 40 yard dash, which when I do combine training, I rarely run 40 yard dashes. In combine training, I stripped their fat first of all. Like I just, I'm like, dude, if you're if you're a skilled athlete, you need to be below eight percent, you know. And uh, you know that's kind of the modality I use, right? And I don't know if it's right or wrong. I don't think I don't think there's any wrong workout, but I'll get into that in a second. But I think that's what I used for my method is to strip the fat off because if you're carrying 20 extra pounds, I don't care what you do. We can strength train, do all you want, speed training, but you still carry an extra 20 pounds. So you're not going to create on force. It's just more forces, it, you know, gravity is the biggest force you can fight, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I think the other next evolution has become in the NCAA and 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 all sports, right? It's nutrition because I think that's a huge component to it. Mm -hmm. And so you do a lot of combine training as well as mm -hmm. your sports specific training. How much different is your combine training when you got guys that are specifically trying to get better for the combine, you know, run a faster 40, get all of their, get their pro agility better, get their vertical jump better when it's not necessarily geared to their performance on the field for that specific day of the combine. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, for those, whatever, eight or 12 weeks, it's just, it's just to beat those tests. Mm -hmm. Like literally I'm just trying to beat those tests in the sense of, you know, what, what programming can I do to get them faster jump further out, whatever it is. Right. So I need yeah. to figure that out. Um, I do two day workouts. I'm a big believer in two day workouts, uh, with the right space and in, in time. And I think the other thing I learned quickly with that was nutrition and overtraining and how to not overtrain them. Right. I thought that was a big thing I learned, you know, and I tried different ways, you know, I, when the Swiss ball came out, I used more Swiss ball stuff, you know, and I, well, that didn't get them strong. My guys got slower. So I threw that out really quickly, right? Because I don't have time. Usually if they don't give me eight to 12 weeks, I won't take the client on just because I know it's how long it's going to take. And it's just going to give them poor results and they're not going to be happy. Right. But yeah, you know, you, you, you focus on those tests, right? Unfortunately, that's what it is. And that's what you got to do because mm -hmm. that's what makes them a lot of money. Right. Cause I do remember when I went to the NFL combine, I remember a kid running, and he ran a four two nine Lila Mako, or I'll never forget that. Everybody just went cha ching, cha ching, cha ching, which meant they made a lot of money. He went in the first round and he probably played only three years, but you know, so I don't think it's the end of all be all the testing. I think you still get it. I think this is gonna be an interesting NFL draft tonight because you gotta evaluate, mm -hmm. right? And we're gonna see who's good evaluators, right? So right. it's just another check off the box, right? For the kids. Yeah. Yeah. No, interesting. Uh, so kind of just to wrap this up, we're running a little bit uh, short on time here. What's one thing over the course of your career that you, you've you changed your mind on? Is there anything that you used to do that now you look back on and think, oh, my God, what was I doing? Or vice versa, something you used to think is a waste of time that now you found purpose in that you implement with your athletes? That's a good question. And uh, I've been fortunate to have really good strength coaches underneath me. Like, I think I'm going to – like I'm doing an Instagram live on Monday nights with, you know, different topics. Like last week was nutrition. I brought in different people. And I think, and I look at my, 
you know, some of the athletes I train, I think there's six strength coaches now at university in Canada as head strength coach, which is, which is awesome. I love it. Right. And a couple of them, you know, I've learned from them. And I think that's a good thing. Right. And I think one thing is just, um, used to, you know, I would just used to, you know, maybe just train legs twice a week. Let's just use that as an example. Right. Or maybe now I do it every day or four or five days by vary the loads and vary the speeds. Right. And I think that's worked effectively. And I think under training people, not over training, but training them to the, you know, instead of doing, well, eight sets, well, six sets give me the same effect of eight sets without fatiguing them. I think that's the art of that, uh, that I've done. And I just, you know, I don't think I use, you know, I just don't believe in gimmicks. I've always said that I'm just not in the gimmicks. Um, uh, I just don't believe in the fad of the week. You know, I think it's going to be science-based, but I also think, Yes, science, but science is behind us. I think you're producing science because you have 80 athletes in your gym with you. And I think that sometimes is your science. You know, you need to figure that out yourself too because that's your test within the test. So yes, so I listened to this, but now I'm going to go test my guys to see if it works as well too, or I'm going to go through these kind of tests, like the Swiss ball thing. I said, I'm going to do Swiss mm -hmm. ball. Well, I got them weaker, so I'm like, hell with it, right? There's no science behind it at that time. I got to get rid of it. So I think that's the other thing too is you're – you know, you're the scientist in your lab. I think that's an important thing for strength coaches to understand too, because they're your athletes, right? In that kind of sense. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Larry, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and get on here with me. Um, for those of you that want, or for those of you listening, want to find you on uh, Instagram, yeah. um, where can they find you? I think I'm coach big dog seven on okay. Instagram or SST.training is my website. And then okay. uh, you can find me there, but yeah, you know, Instagram, I think this Monday, love to have you on Instagram live. You know, I'm sure we can talk about that. For sure. Yeah. On a Monday night. I'm just trying to, I could probably do it every night, but it cuts into my dinner time. So I'm kind of yeah. like, <laughs> but I will bring you on. And I'm going to bring on some strength coaches at different levels too. So we can talk about shop and things like that. So sounds good. I'll, 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 sure. I'll put your social media accounts in the description below in case yeah. so people can find sure. you. But yeah, thanks for coming on sure. and take care, yeah. Larry. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it, man.